All right, I'm going to do a sermon request here. Um, I had a couple different brethren uh, write me and say, how do you prepare a sermon? They want to start house churches or whatever, and they came up with a very good question. Uh, as a pastor, how would, do you prepare a sermon for people? So I'm going to actually do a sermon on preparing a sermon. Kind of unique. But um, there are three different types of preaching that I'm going to be covering in this little short study. First of all, you would have evangelistic preaching. That would be your preaching of the gospel to the lost world to get them saved. All right. Secondly, you would have exhorting the saved brethren. Exhorting them, encouraging them, rebu reproving, rebuking, exhorting, you know. Thirdly, you have teaching the brethren so that they can go out and teach others. Okay? And I just want to apologize, by the way, before I go on, if you can probably hear my voice is kind of scratchy. I've had a cold for about a week, so I'm still getting over it. So I apologize in advance for that. But uh, we're going to start out here talking about evangelistic preaching. We're going to start in Luke chapter 9, verse 6. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Okay? So you see, before the crucifixion, Doctrinally, it would have been in the Old Testament, Hebrews chapter 9, the death of the testator brings in the New Testament. When Jesus died on the cross, that started the New Testament. So this is pre-crucifixion. It's doctrinally in the Old Testament. That's why you see preaching the gospel and healing. The sign gift there being with the preaching of the word to confirm the word to the Jewish people. Okay. Now that we're going to see an example of what happens after uh, the, the death, burial, resurrection, of Jesus Christ and into the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 verse 3. Now if you know your Bible, Acts chapter 8 is follows Acts chapter 7. Well, what happened in Acts chapter 7? Well you had the, the death of the first Christian there. You had Stephen being stoned to death and a young man named Saul is there and he sees it. So let's start out here. Acts chapter 8 verse 3 says here, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. Okay? I believe that they were spreading the gospel out at that point in time. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 19. We'll see another example here. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, like we just read there in Acts chapter 8, traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and, and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Um, see, the book of Acts is a transitional book. All right, You see this thing, they start out talking and preaching to the Jews, and as time goes by, they start to preach to the Gentiles as well. We'll see that in the study. Um, actually, the next couple of verses. Acts chapter 11, verse 20. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they came to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So, of course, you're starting to see the transition from just to the Jews to now Jews and Gentiles. Okay? Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. <clears throat> now let me just kick a little movement here real quick while I'm at it. Don't ever fall for the lie that people were saved by looking forward to the cross. You just saw it there in the one verse there in Romans that it was hid. It, the, the gospel was hidden from people in the past, ages in the past. That's why in the gospels you see them when Jesus is telling them what kind of death he's going to die, they're going, huh, what? You know, I don't, I don't get it. You know, they didn't know about Jesus dying on the cross. There are some prophecies that Jesus would come and, you know, Jesus as Christ would die and he would be the Messiah of the Jewish people. <clears throat> but this thing of them looking forward to the cross to be saved is nonsense. Okay, there is no scripture for that. What you have there is people who do not rightly divide the word of truth and they try to make the whole Bible teach one gospel when it doesn't. Now, how will your evangelistic preaching be viewed by the lost? 
Okay, when you put together sermons or when you, you know, and I'm going to talk about different ways to preach to the lost if you have a house church. Um, but how will your preaching, how, you know, what should you expect from the lost world as far as them accepting your preaching? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. When you decide to preach, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ right straight out of your King James Bible. Don't try to pretty it up. Okay? Don't try to try to mince words and try to, you know, make Jesus look like somebody that he wasn't. Jesus Christ of the Bible is very much different than what most people perceive him to be. All right? Don't try to change him. Don't be ashamed of him. Preach the word. Okay? Preach the gospel. Read verses. Quote verses out of your King James Bible. Don't try to get rid of the archaic language or anything else. God's not going to bless that, all right? It doesn't matter what you do. The preaching of the cross is going to be, to those people that are perishing, it's going to be foolishness to them. That's what the Bible says. Okay? Now you say, well, where, if I have a house church or a small little church somewhere, how am I going to be able to preach to the lost? I mean, if you have a church building, well, you can have lost people come in there, but there's issues with that. I've talked about that in other sermons and studies, so I'm not going to get into it here. But if you have a house church, obviously you can't just put a sign out along the road and say, hey, everybody's welcome. It's not a good idea. Okay. What do you do? How do you have an outreach ministry? Well, here's a couple different ideas. First of all, you can get a website. They're not that expensive. You can even get them for free and just write out the gospel. Put a little message on there, different little messages or whatever. Secondly, you have video, what I'm doing right now. Okay, you can get cheap little webcams and, I mean, there's, you can get into it for very, very low money. All right, some of my materials are more expensive, a little bit more money involved here, but you don't have to go this far with it. You don't have to have the lighting and everything else. Just, just sit in front of a camera and preach the word to, to people. And you're probably not going to get very many views, you know, at first. But in time, your channel will grow. Maybe you can put your video on other, out there in other venues and things. Just another thought. Also, there's radio program. There are a lot of radio stations out there. AM and FM is probably going to be too expensive, but uh, maybe even shortwave. I don't know. I never really looked into that. But there, I know that there are radio stations that you can get on, and you can preach the word there. You can preach evangelistic messages. Okay. Another thing that you can do, write a gospel tract. Get a computer program, write up a little tract or write it some kind of thing that you can fold up and hand out to people or go distribute it or whatever. Write a gospel tract with an evangelistic gospel message in it. Also another way is street preaching. Okay, That's what they did in the book of Acts. You don't see them building buildings and saying everybody's welcome, come as you are, do as you please, you know. You don't see that. What you see is they're meeting together among themselves and then going out into the world and preaching in the street corners. In fact, going into the Jewish synagogues and preaching. Um, good luck doing that today. But that's another option. Okay, You can preach on the street corner and you'll look like a fool. I've done it a couple times and you feel quite foolish. I mean, it's, it's a neat feeling. It's exhilarating. But... Most of the people driving by think that you're a fool. <laughs> Another way that you can preach is through personal witnessing. Uh, just going out to a store someplace, talking to people, going out wherever, talking to family, talking to friends, talking to co-workers, uh, whatever. Okay, that's something that will come in time as you are get more and more familiar with the, the Word of God. You're able to quote more Scripture, turn to more Scripture. 
you know, that's going to be something that's real difficult. You'll find when you start to witness to people and you might have a hundred verses memorized and when it gets into that stress, you'll forget all of them. <laughs> and, you know, you'll say, well, the Bible says such and such and they'll say, where's it at? And you go, uh, you know, believe me, I've, I've, not many pe I've not met many Christians that can just turn to Scripture like that when they're out witnessing you know, one-on-one. -on -one. It gets very stressful when you do that, so you've got to practice that stuff. But there are a lot of different venues where you can do your evangelistic preaching. Now, the second type of preaching that you're going to have to do if you want to have a little house church or, or whatever, the second type of preaching that you're going to need to do, you will need to exhort the brethren that are there, okay? Your church family, you're going to need to exhort them, encourage them, get them motivated all right that's what you're going to need need to do acts, <clears throat> excuse me acts chapter 15 verse 30 so when they were dismissed they came to antioch and when they had gathered the multitude together they delivered the epistle which when they had read they rejoiced for the consolation and judas and silas being prophets also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them and after they had tarried there a space they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas came to Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So you see the two different things there. They were not only exhorting, but they were also teaching. All right, that's important. We'll get into that a little bit later as well. But I'm going to tell you, <coughs> the hardest thing for a Christian today to do is to keep their mind focused on eternity, on eternal things. All right, I mean, we have literally thousands more things to occupy our minds than they did in the first century. Okay, think about it. The people that came to your little church meeting there, how did they come? They came in a vehicle. So they come out into their vehicle, they have to think, okay, I have to put the key in here. Is it in park or is it in neutral or whatever? You know, and they turn the key, get the thing started. How much gas do I have? What's the oil pressure look like? What's the battery gauge look like? You know, uh, is everybody in the car? Okay, let's put it in gear. Let's drive down the road. Oh, there's a stop sign. What road are we supposed to turn on? Uh, turn off the radio there. Turn the heater on. Turn the air conditioning on. You know, and I could go on and on and on. I mean, it's, it's crazy. The things that we have to occupy our minds with, our jobs, our houses, our electric bills, our food, our, you know, all the different things. It's amazing that we're even sane, <laughs> you know, but it's important as a preacher to exhort the people, keep your mind focused on eternity. You have to do things down here. I understand that. You have to live. You have to earn a living. You have bills to pay. You have to get food, cook food, keep the house clean, whatever. But you can't lose sight of eternity. You have to remember this life down here is not it. All right? That's our life up there. Eternity is going to be our home, not here. So you have to exhort the brethren. Keep them remembering that there's a judgment coming. Okay, their works are going to be judged. The judgment seat of Christ. You know, don't forget that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. Okay, you see a couple of things there. <clears throat> First, First of all, verse 1 there said that you are to walk and please God. All right? Over there in Revelation, uh, it talks about that we are created for the Lord's pleasure. We're created to bring Him joy, to do His work. 
uh, verse 3 and 4 talk about sanctification. All right, when you are a pastor, you're going to have to teach your flock how to separate, how to be separate from the world, how to be set apart from the world. You're going to have to rebuke things like television, things like uh, drunkenness, um, immodest dress, a lot of things like that that can help them sanctify their lives, set them apart from the world. They should not look like the world and be like the world. They should be different. Okay? And the fifth one there, or the, uh, sorry, the uh, next one there in verse 7 is holiness. Are the people that are in your congregation, are they living holy lives? Separated holy lives. Are they living like that? That's your job. As a pastor, your job is to preach to them, to exhort them, to live sanctified, holy lives. That's what your job is supposed to do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Again, excellent instruction in righteousness for a man that is a pastor. Okay? You're to exhort the brethren. You are to warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, people that are going through depression, people that have some sickness and things and they just, things don't, Makes sense, whatever. You're gonna to have to comfort them, all right. Good way to do that is to remind them about eternity. Support the weak, okay, and be patient toward all men. Patience is a virtue that you will need as a pastor, without doubt. Second Timothy chapter four verse two says, "Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine." And we're going to get into doctrine here in the next one. But you see the thing there again, reproving, rebuking, exhorting. All right, two-thirds negative, one-third positive. In other words, there's a lot of things in this world right now that need to be reproved, need to be rebuked. Warn your congregation about those things. Okay, a good method would be look at your news and things, things that are going on. I'll give you a good example right now, all this anti-gun stuff. Now, you can disagree with me if you want to. I don't really care. But the fact of the matter is, if the government takes away the guns, America's going to be in a lot of trouble, a whole lot of trouble. So if, as a Christian pastor, you need to warn your flock about that. You need to go through the Bible and say, what does the Bible teach about the rights of self-defense, about submission to government, about things related to that? You know, Does the Bible teach blind subservience to tyrannical leaders. No, it doesn't. I'll just say that. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 through 9 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. All right. Your job as a preacher is to exhort the brethren to live a holy life that's acceptable to God and to keep them motivated, keep them going so that they don't faint. Why? So that they'll reap a full reward someday. If you just let them just go and, well, I don't really care. I don't really know if the Bible says this or that. or uh, you, know, you don't want to take any strong stands and the people in your congregation fall into sin and get messed up. You're going to be held accountable for that. Okay? Very important. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Now, how should you deliver these speech or your uh, sermons? How should you, you know, should you stand up there and really yell and, and holler and things? Let me show you about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 it says here, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. There is no reason why you should change your voice from your normal voice and put on some kind of special stage voice. 
you know. And a normal reaction too, by the way, when you preach is there should be, as Paul said here in verse 3, I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling. There should be some nervousness when you stand up to preach. If there isn't, you know, well, I don't know. But uh, don't stand up there and, you know, get nutso and stuff on them and, and, you know, be out there yelling, the Bible says and stuff. Don't do that. You don't have to do that. You know, just preach the way that you normally talk. You're, you're trying to exhort them. You're trying to, to get them motivated and things like that. Let the Scripture do it. Let the Holy Spirit do it. Not you doing some kind of pep rally, some kind of, you know, sound like a professional wrestler or something talking. I mean, uh, you know what I'm saying. The third type of preaching that you're going to have to do as a, as a pastor, if you want to start a little house church or something, is teaching. You have to teach the brethren the doctrines of the Bible. And part of that is so that they can go out and teach others also. Titus chapter 1 verse 3. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Manifest the word of God to people through the preaching. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 2 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's a very important thing. And by the way, don't think that you have to reinvent the wheel every time, you know, I just got saved, so i got to reinvent the wheel. Say, so what are you talking about? You don't have to come up and just approach the Bible, you know, fresh, just, I'll learn it all myself. There are other great men out there, men from the past that have gone through a lot of experiences, and you can learn a lot from them. I'm not saying that they're infallible. They're not on the level of Scripture. But you can learn from older men. That's what's being talked about there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. The things that Paul committed to Timothy, he said the, the, that uh, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. All right, that's what the way the, the preaching is. It succeeds down through, it's successive, I mean, down through the generations. You teach it to faithful men, they teach it to other faithful men, they teach it to the next generation, to the next generation, and on down through. That's very important as well. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4.13, another interesting verse here, it says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to be a good preacher, you will have to love, love to read. All right, you're going to have to learn to read not only the Bible, Right? This is the most important. But there's a lot of books. A lot of these books back in here will be a great help to you as a pastor and a great encouragement to those who are under your ministry. Okay, When they hear that there are men, you know, some of these books, oh, up here. Some of these books like up here, you have the some of the heroes of the faith. Um, Charles Spurgeon, Spurgeon and Sam Jones and J. Frank Norris and guys like that to read stories about them and then incorporate it into your sermon, it, encourage, it will encourage the brethren to see that the struggles that they're going through, Christians have gone through those same things 100, 200 or more years ago. So that's also a very important thing. There's a lot of studying that you should do. And by the way, along those lines, the Bible does warn about in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that you're not to be a novice. All right? Give it some time, right? Don't think, oh man, I'm I'm getting all fired up. I'm already here, you know. I'm gonna I'm called to preach. I can just I know I'm called to preach, you know. I I'm I'm gonna preach. I'm I'm gonna study the Bible for a year and I'm gonna go to preaching. Remember that Jesus Christ was 30 years old before he began his earthly ministry. Okay, there are some things that you just can't learn from just reading. There are some things that you're gonna have to experience. All right. You're going to have to have a few years behind you before I believe the Lord will really use you that well. All right. If you're a young man and you feel called to preach, by all means, hold on to that, but spend your time studying. Read as much as you can. 
get firmly grounded in the Word, know how to answer false prophets and things like that, false systems. You need to know that stuff. And that takes years of study. And you need to also have some time on the street, you know, whether it be witnessing one-on-one -on -one or talking to people at work, talking to friends, family, whatever. You need to get some of that time in before you really should be preaching. Next, we're going to go here to Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31. It says here, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. All right? You say, what was the kingdom of God that he was preaching? Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Those are things that you're also going to have to preach as a pastor. Okay? And it's interesting because if you understand Scripture and doctrine, it will lead to righteousness, peace, and joy. So, very good. Now there are two ways, I'll say this, there are two ways of teaching the Bible, okay? First of all, there's expository. Okay, you say, what's expository? Well, what you would do is you'd say, all right, we're going to go through the book of Micah. Now we're going to start here at verse 1. And then you would just start reading down through the chapter. And if you see tie-ins here, you'd study it first. Don't just ad lib it. But study the, the passage before you, you stand up to preach. Sunday morning or whenever you decide to meet and because I'm saying there could be persecution coming in the future and you might not be able to preach every single week on Sunday morning from 9 to 12 okay you got the ch Christian church can be flexible as far as your service times are concerned but when you do expository preaching you go through it you study it verse by verse and then if there are tie-ins if I read something in verse 1 and it's a, I say, oh yeah, that reminds me of that verse over in the book of Acts. Well then, see, you would write that down in your notes or whatever. That, you know, read the verse and then you say, okay, now turn to Acts. Keep your hand there in Micah. And now turn to the book of Acts. Chapter 4 or something, whatever, you know. And then you read that verse and you say, so now see how that ties in there? And let's go back to Micah. Let's read verse 2. You know, and maybe you won't see anything in there, but you go to verse 3. And there's two things in the book of Romans that you want to show, two different chapters, whatever. But what you're doing is you're going uh, precept upon precept, line upon line, you know, going scripture by scripture, verse by verse. That's expository study. Okay? The second type of teaching, second type of way that you can teach the Bible is subject teaching. Okay? That's been the majority of what I do what I've done for many, many years, I teach on subjects. Um, marriage, divorce, uh, suicide and the Christian, uh, eternal security, faith, works, um, grace, faith, uh, the miracles, healing, tongues, uh, the resurrection, the rapture. See, those are all subjects. And what you do is you go through the Bible and you develop things around that. And now on the last part of this little video here, what do you need to prepare sermons? Because this is kind of a spinoff of what I was just talking about there. Subject preaching, one of the things that you will need is a concordance. Okay, when I did my sermon on tongues, speaking in tongues, what I did is I used what in your King James Bible, it's called the Law of First Mention. Now, the King James Bible is a very unique book because many times the very first time a word appears, it will be defined in the context of the verse or in preceding or succeeding you know, verses. It's a, an amazing book. So if you want to do a sermon on tongues, you look in your concordance, you go to the T section and you say, okay, where's the word tongues at? You know. And you find it, and you go, oh, back in Genesis. And you go the whole way back there, and you look, and you say, yeah, okay, that defines it, or, well, actually, it doesn't really make it that clear. Let's see what the next reference is. You see, it's kind of like doing a word study. You can do that. 
Uh, another good thing with with uh, our concordances, you know, as you read the Bible, you become more familiar with it. You'll be doing a verse, and the Lord will bring a verse. Or I'm sorry, you'll be doing a, a sermon, and the Lord will bring a verse to your mind like that ties in with this verse, and you go, "Oh, where's that thing at? Uh, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What? Oh, where is that?" And so you pick a word like soul or something, you know, and you go to the S section there in soul and you scan down through, oh, there's the verse. That's the one I wanted. Very helpful with that. And, of course, now we have modern technology too, so we have Sword Searcher. This software here is also very handy because this enables you to type in a couple words that would be in a, in a verse. It'll take you right to it. This does not... Get rid of this, though. Okay, there are many times that I still use my uh, Strong's Concordance. And, of course, as I've said in other studies, don't mess with the Greek and the Hebrew in, ba in the back of the Strong's Concordance. It's based on uh, the Dr. Strong there was a member of the American Standard Version Committee. He has a lot of the Greek words there. He has the wrong definitions. So you'll go to, the, to look up a Greek word. And you'll see that the, it's defined the way that, like the NIV, would translate it. So don't worry about the Greek and the Hebrew. Uh, but it, it's still a good concordance. I still use it to look up words in your King James Bible. Another thing that is good is a Webster's 1828 dictionary. Okay, This thing here will help you define some of the words. And that's another good thing to do. You could look up, say, the word tongues, like I said earlier. Look it up, law of first mention in your King James Bible, but you can also look it up in the dictionary here and say, the dictionary defines tongues as, and then you spin off from there. Okay? Another good thing to do. And ironically, if you get the sword searcher or software, I'm not making any money from this, so don't get excited, but if you get this thing here, it actually has not only the concordance feature, it also has Webster's 1828 Dictionary right in it, along with a lot of other study aids and things too. So I recommend that. It's really good. I use that a lot when I'm doing sermons. And of course, what else do you need? Well, when you do a sermon, it's real nice to have it printed out. Okay. I just have Microsoft Word on, on my uh, computer. Just sit there and type out the sermon. When it comes time to, if you want to put scripture in, like I did with this study, where I'm not having to turn a lot in the Bible, just as a special study here, um, I'll use this. You can copy and paste whole portions of scripture, put it right onto your Word document, print it right out. It's real handy. So I do, I do, I do like to print mine. Um, I have done different sermons where I'm preaching in front of people, where I'm having them turn in the Bible. And that way I don't have to, to type all these scriptures out. I just say turn in to Luke chapter 9, verse 6. We all turn there and we read it. In that case, I have actually written my uh, sermon notes out by hand, you know, pen and paper. So you can do that too. So that's basically it when it comes to how to prepare a sermon. Uh, there are, of course, other ways and, and other things I've probably left out of this video that would be helpful to you, but those are the basics. Uh, if you're going to be a pastor, um, those are your three responsibilities. You need to preach to the lost, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. You need to preach, um, yeah, I'm sorry, you need to exhort the saved brethren, and you need to teach the saved brethren as well. You need to get, get those people motivated you know, not with an act, some kind of circus little performance that you put on. That's just flesh, okay? Exhort them with Scripture. Let the power of the Word of God work in their hearts. You know, let the Lord speak through you. And another thing that you should do, every time I sit down to write a sermon out, I'll pray before I start. And I just, Lord, please help me with this sermon. Please show me what you want me to say. That's probably the most important thing when it comes to preaching. Okay? Let the Lord give you your sermons. And, you know, you're going to be nervous. 
It's just the way it is. But uh, this world is in very, very short supply uh, for good preachers. And I'll tell you right now, if you have any inkling at all in you to preach the Word of God, please do that if you're a man. Okay, if you're a woman, you can, you know, you're a saved woman and you've watched this video, you can put together sermons too. And, you know, you can share it with your family. You can preach to other women. You know, there's no problem with that. You know, the, the, the Bible's not against that. It's just a pastor role, the role of overseeing the flock. That's what the Lord is saying. No, I don't want you doing that. Teaching uh, men, you know, having authority over men, it's not what the Lord wants. Okay? Preaching is the role of the man. And if you're a man and you feel the Lord's calling you to preach, I really, we need more good preachers that believe this book right here. Okay, we got enough that believe the other, you know, perversions. All right, preach the word. And I'll tell you right now, the Lord will reward you for it in eternity. Okay, so that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.